So good morning again and welcome. I'm Heather Drake. I'm the membership and engagement director with the Maine Public Health Association. And I'm so excited to be here this morning with you all for our public health career panel as part of the celebration of National Public Health Week. Um, so the, the theme for that this year is centering and celebrating cultures in public health. And today um, not only focuses on violence prevention as the daily theme, but also on students. So we thought this would be a relevant topic. Um, a couple housekeeping items before we start. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You can do your name, um, what school or organization you're affiliated with, or maybe you don't have an affiliation, pronouns. Um, and then you can feel free to share how you're feeling today if you'd like to. Uh, we do ask that you stay muted. We'll have a discussion after we hear from each of our panelists, um, which if you have a question, you can come off mute to ask that, or you can do that in the chat, uh, but we'll wait and hold questions until the end. Uh, closed captioning is available if that's something that you're looking for. And uh, as I already mentioned, we are recording today's session and it will be on uh, MPHA's website uh, probably later today. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for today to introduce our panelists and then we'll hear from each of them. Um, I'm joined by Mayor Farrow, who is the leader of the Bowdoin Public Health Club and both a member and intern with MPHA. So thank you for moderating today, Mayor. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, so for our uh, panel today, I'm really excited to introduce to you to start with Jay Knowlton, the Product Strategy Director at Quartet Health. Dr. Liz Sharnetsky, staff scientist with the Center for Interdisciplinary Population Health Research at Maine Health Institute for Research, and Noah Ventimiglia, a clinical community health worker. We're also thrilled to welcome Kate Bourne, a global health consultant, and Isaac Benowitz, who's the state epidemiologist and chief medical officer at the Maine CDC. Um, so thank you all again so much for joining us and welcome to everyone who's watching the panel. So um, to start with, uh, if we could just uh, move down the list, I'll start with Jay for some introductory remarks, about five minutes per panelist. Cool. Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all and be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Jay Knowlton. I'm a product strategy director at Quartet Health, uh, and I'm the president of the Maine Public Health Association for, I think I'm in the middle of a two-year term. So um, I'm pretty engaged with MPHA and have found that that's a a really great organization and encourage you all to kind of double down on your engagement uh, and and work through the um, the mentorship program and other kind of student oriented uh, programming that MPHA offers to the extent that you're able to. Um, so I work at Quartet Health, which is a, a technology and services company that that owns a behavioral health clinic and works with health insurance companies to proactively identify and engage people. Uh, at risk or rising risk for mental and behavioral health conditions and work with uh, primary care and other um, kind of traditional physical health care providers to get those folks into the right treatment for them and try to do that in a kind of a culturally competent and appropriate manner for whatever is, is right for those patients and meeting them where they are. Um, so it's it's been a really interesting journey for me. I, I kind of was one of those folks who thought they wanted to be a physician and followed that path through undergrad and then uh, kind of had a little existential crisis in my senior year as all of my peers were, um, you know, applying rapidly to schools and, and feeling very confident that that was the track for them. And I was looking at the cost and the time commitment and the years down that path and uh, I couldn't get myself to go for that. So um, I had a great career counselor at the University of Maine uh, who kind of pointed me to go check out uh, career opportunities in public health and then got lured in uh, by the folks at USM at the Muskie Schools Public Health Program and had a great option and a great ride to go through that. Um, and then they were really well connected in the community. And next thing I knew, um, I was working full time for Dartmouth, studying variations in care and outcomes and um, learning a lot about the field that I was studying at night in, in the classroom. Uh, and, and that, I think, actually is one of the things that I might I might say is a really important takeaway is like if you're thinking about going into an MPH program, if you haven't yet, like working at least part time while going through that was really valuable experience for me. Um, and working in nonprofit academia, I think, was also a really nice compliment for 
um, going through uh, grad school at that time as well. Uh, but I eventually, after several years there, after finishing my degree program, was kind of looking for something a little different, maybe new, fast paced, uh, found myself in this like New York based venture capital backed high growth technology enabled company that was not really where I planned to go. Um, but I had connections. And so actually, maybe that's another takeaway is like, work your network and figure out, you know, who can make the connections to anybody who will speak to you, really. Um, I, I learned a lot over maybe like a, probably a five year period going through grad school and early past that, just meeting everyone who was even tangentially or peripherally um, working related to my field. So um, that is definitely a really important takeaway for me. And I, I still try to make time to connect with people whenever I can. Um, and you never really know where those are going to go. Maybe a lot of them are dead ends, but every now and again, there's somebody when you need a favor, you can call up and, you know, that's what happened to me. And I had a great job offer and I work fully remotely from my little office in Portland, Maine and um, get to work on some some really cool, interesting things that are you know, very data oriented, but also very human touch oriented. So um, I can speak a little bit more about that, but I know we have lots of other panelists to go through. So maybe I'll pause there and pass it down the line. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, that was great. Um, Dr. Sharnetsky, I'm going to hear from you next. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz. Um, I am a staff scientist at Maine Health Institute for Research, and I'm housed specifically within the Center for Interdisciplinary Population and Health Research. It's quite a name. We call it Cypher. <laughs> um, and let's see. So my journey to public health was, I think, pretty non-traditional. My background is actually in experimental social psychology. So I went to school and really trained with the intention of becoming a professor in a more traditionally academic role. Um, and I think up until probably midway through my PhD program, I was pretty set on that trajectory. I started um, my research career looking at experiences of social devaluation and how it affects a sense of belonging for women in underrepresented groups in STEM fields, um, specifically kind of looking at within um, more kind of um, organizational structure. And then I got involved in a project that looked at HIV stigma and how stigmatization of HIV affects not only um, how individuals interact with the healthcare system, but also how people in the healthcare system interact with individuals. And I got kind of hooked. I was like, wow, this is really important. This is really impactful. This is really interesting. This has just so much application for real life, which was, I think, something up until that point I hadn't really um, hadn't really recognized to the full degree that um, traditional academic research, while really important and interesting and fun to characterize kind of the state of the world through an objective third party lens with these really rigorous methods, didn't have as many applications um, to real life as I would have liked. So I was like, I want to find a job where I can do this kind of geeky work that I love, but also have a direct connection to communities so that we can kind of close that feedback loop and, and see that make a difference, see those lessons learned be implemented, really benefit the people in my communities, the folks that I love and live with. Um, so that motivated me to seek out jobs like the one I have currently at Maine Health. Um, our center is really interdisciplinary. We have pretty diverse professional backgrounds. We have folks with backgrounds in epidemiology, um, sociology, anthropology, social psychology. There's one other social psychologist there as well. Um, and so it's a really neat way to bring together all different you know, ways of looking at the world and human experience. And we all broadly study how to optimize um, health service and how, how to optimize the delivery of health service and, and make it the most um, welcoming, engaging, responsive process that we can. So we have a great opportunity to work directly with clinicians and give, you know, work with how to, how to change their daily practice and change their procedures. And, and um, it's just very, very fulfilling. I would say, that that is one of my favorite parts about my job is how interdisciplinary it is and how collaborative it is. Um, I'm going to steal a line from Bill Klein, who's a social psychologist at NCI, but he says, back in grad school, I thought that being interdisciplinary was walking down the hall and talking to developmental psychologists, and that was interdisciplinary, and I certainly felt the same way, but that, that kind of rocked my world coming to Maine Health 
it's truly interdisciplinary. So I think that's my favorite thing, but it's also the greatest challenge that I think I've been in, um, faced at Main Health is that, you know, while we're often talking about the same social phenomena that we're observing in the world, health disparities in a particular um, uh, disease track or, or whatnot, or um, people with particular social identities feeling disengaged from healthcare, um, we might be talking about the same phenomenon. We have a lot of different language to do that and a lot of different methods that we might use to arrive at the same conclusion. So that's been really fun, but also really challenging. So I'd say that um, Maine Health and our relationship with Maine Public Health Association has been really beneficial in that because it's been a really great way to get kind of exposure and create the network that I think Jay also talked about as well. So um, I, think, I think I will stop there and pass it along. I think I'm sure I've talked for five minutes at this point, so I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're great. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and next is Noah. It's, I'm Noah and I'm a clinical community health worker. I started as a clinic, a community health worker, but I've recently added this clinical part where I get to work with the primary care physicians at Greater Portland Health which is a great company in uh, the Portland area, has a bunch of clinics and it focuses on um, meeting pe patients where they're at. Um, I, in my community health worker role, I was working at a few hotels in South Portland that were housing um, people without homes and uh, new Mainers especially. And the clinics in Portland that Greater Portland Health has um, focus on treating uh, patients that uh, don't have ways to pay for healthcare um, and new Mainers in particular. Um, I'm currently working at the new shelter in um, Portland that's uh, housing a lot of um, people that moved from the Oxford Street shelter in uh, downtown Portland um, and new Mainers as well. And I'm working with a, a few primary care doctors um, and also focusing on the social determinants of, of health uh, when I'm not assisting the primary care doctors. Um, I'm in many ways very new to my public health career. I graduated from undergrad in 2020. And like Jay, I was a pre-med student um, thinking about going into medical school, um, but realized that public in public health, there are many ways to be able to help um, people without being a, a physician. There are uh, so many um, things to address in social determinants of health that will uh, make a huge difference in people's lives. Um, what got me into public health was both my parents did a, a graduate degree in um, public health, and I grew up in Tanzania and Zambia, um, and I got to witness some of their work um, doing HIV and AIDS prevention, and my dad was working with uh, street children in Zambia. Um, so that's what really got me into to public health. Um, so I did pre-med in undergrad, um, but I took a bunch of public health and anthropology classes as well. Um, and I realized uh, that there are so many things that I can do to, to do what I want to help people. Um, in the field of public health. Um, so right now I'm working at the new shelter. I'm working with a couple primary care physicians that are at the shelter and treating people and meeting people where they are, but also looking at the social determinants of health um, and trying to figure out patterns of uh, how, how uh, social determinants of health contribute to especially new Mainers and immigrants from Angola and Congo, um, how, how social determinants of health uh, can be addressed, especially in the shelter setting. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Nella. Um, and next we have Kate Thorne. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for inviting me to be on this panel. It's been quite a while since I've been with uh, public health students, even virtually, and it's really a pleasure. And I loved hearing about what the huge range of things that the other panelists are engaged in. It's really, it's really amazing. 
I was not pre-med. I was an English major in college and my first jobs were in literary publishing. But I was restless. I'd lived in different places as a child and I really wanted to get further afield. So I spent a year when I was 25 traveling around the world. And but by the time I came back, I knew that I wanted some kind of international career. At that point, it could have been health or human rights or foreign relations. I really didn't know, but I knew I wanted to focus on women. I had I had met women while I was traveling that were so like me in many ways, but whose lives were so dramatically different. And I, so I knew I wanted to focus on, on that. Not long after that, I, I found myself in Houston without much warning. Uh, as one does. And I discovered that all of the University of Texas health schools were there. And I applied to the School of Public Health kind of, you know, on a whim. Um, and a few weeks later, I started classes with a focus on reproductive health, or as it was called then international and family health. This was way back when public health was in no way cool. So it was not unusual to just sort of pick up and decide to go to school. Um, but studying public health was really a revelation. Uh, I had not taken things like biostatistics and epidemiology before and political economy. And it just really changed the way I thought about everything. And then a week after I graduated, I moved to Beijing and started to work for the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA. Um, Later, I lived in Hanoi working with Pathfinder International and the Ministry of Health of Vietnam on the first major uh, reproductive health project since the lifting of the trade embargo. And I eventually returned to the US, but I continued to work for international NGOs on projects in Asia and Africa, and that's, that's what I still do today. Um, about 14 years ago, I became a consultant and um, have once you do that, it's hard to go back. Um, but but I just I, I I find that international public health touches so many disciplines, much as Liz was saying, and and interests, and has it's allowed me to live and work around the world with fascinating people um, to tackle very challenging problems. And I just really wouldn't trade what I had done for anything. Among the rewards is seeing how much has been accomplished in reproductive health in the last 30 plus years. It's, it's, I think it's easy for all of us to focus on what remains to be done, and there's a lot, <laughs> but around the world, maternal mortality rates, neonatal tetanus. When I was in grad school, that was a huge focus, and now it's really a minor issue. Um, and, and many other conditions have have really improved, although you know with an asterisk that we don't really know what the full impact of the COVID pandemic will be on all of this progress. Family planning is far more widely available around the world, even for young adolescents. Abortion has become safer and in many places less restricted. Obviously, in my own country, abortion is no longer even a basic right for all women. Um, and I find this really the most challenging thing in my career is to feel like my own country has gone backwards. Um, it's it's definitely the most discouraging aspect for of, uh, for me. But our work is not over. We will we will carry on. And so that gives me something to to keep going on for the for the future. So there's there's plenty left to do. So I'll I'll pause there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. And last but not least, we have Dr. Benowitz. Thanks, um, Kate. I appreciated what you what you said about backsliding, and I think there's it's always an uphill battle for all of us. So definitely part of what we do in public health. So hi everyone, I'm Isaac. I'm the state epidemiologist and chief medical officer at Maine CDC, your state health department. Um, I do a number of things at the health department. A lot of that, a lot of my work focuses on infectious diseases, but I also work in our environmental health areas and injury. And I really enjoy working sort of across disciplines. Um, 
I've been at Maine CDC for about a year and a half, and I'll tell you just a little bit about how I landed there. Um, I started out as a physics major in college, knew that I loved science, but really wanted to find a way to do something that felt a little bit more practical, a little more impactful on real lives and a little farther from the laboratory bench. I, um, I really fell into public health after college. I was exploring ways to sort of use my skills in a way that felt meaningful. And I think that in some ways, everything that I've done, I can define as trying to find a way to use the skills and tools that um, were interesting and that I felt that I was good at to impact something in a positive way. I, um, I landed at a consulting firm in the Boston area where I was living at the time that did environmental health and occupational health research for federal government agencies. Um, and um, I spent about four years learning to were affected by um, toxic waste areas and toxic releases around the country. And that really got me excited in public health and it got me excited in the possibility of a career in public health, but it left me a little unsure of how I wanted to pursue that. And after talking to a number of friends and colleagues and mentors, um, I ended up going to medical school because I really believed that it would be the best way to be well grounded in all in a broad range of human health issues. And at the time, I thought I also wanted to see patients, and that's fallen a little farther afield because I love what I do in public health, and it doesn't leave a lot of time to do any clinical work. Um, I went to medical school, I trained in pediatrics, and then I jumped back into public health with US CDC. They have this fellowship program, it's a two-year program called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. The EIS officers are 80 to 100 people who join CDC per year and really work on the front lines of public health across the country and around the world. And so of those 80 to 100 people, most of them are based in Atlanta in various CDC program offices. So there's be one person who spends two years focused on foodborne outbreaks and another person who focuses on TB in sub-Saharan Africa and another person who focuses on physical activity and obesity. And then um, a subset of that group, um, instead of being based in Atlanta for two years, is assigned to state and local health departments around the country. So um, I felt really fortunate to land with some really superb mentors at the New York City Health Department. Spent two years there getting New York City hospitals ready for Ebola back in 2014 and responding to some big infectious disease outbreaks and just sort of learning the ropes and understanding some of the chronic disease side of the agency. Um, I loved my time in New York City, but was looking for something a little different afterwards. And I spent about five years down in Atlanta at CDC headquarters where I focused on investigating outbreaks of infectious diseases in hospitals and nursing homes and other healthcare settings. Um, really loved that work, very um, obscure, but very sort of intellectually interesting and um, really enjoyed seeing um, some of the results of some of those investigations turn into the policies that keep patients and healthcare workers safe in healthcare facilities across the country and around the world. Um, but I missed the population focus that I had when I was in New York City and I wanted to come back to the Northeast. And when an opportunity opened up here, about a year and a half ago, I was really fortunate to jump up here. And so um, I will also just say, I really enjoy that I'm not the guy in charge of the health department. Um, I really serve as a senior advisor to the leadership team. And I like being a little farther behind the scenes where I can really focus on public health science and epidemiology and policy and supporting our staff. And I, I help to maintain some of our communications with clinicians across the state. So I send out all of our um, health advisories I maintain communications with colleagues in Atlanta at CDC and at health departments across the country to try to develop the best practices to protect the health of everyone in the state and elsewhere. Um, I think I'll stop there for um, intro remarks. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Benowitz, and thank you all again for, for introducing yourselves. Um, so next, we're going to move to some audience questions, like Heather said in the chat. Um, you can drop questions here in the chat, or you can um, raise your hand and come off of mute to ask questions.
I can get the ball rolling. Um, at least I have some questions. Um, so I'll just ask a question and anyone in the panel who wants to answer, feel free to do so. Um, so what kind of skills do you think are essential for success in your respective career? I can start since I was at the top of the list. Uh, I have found that a sense of curiosity is a really, really useful thing to have. And the the question of why and then the motivation. Well, I guess the foresight to ask the question why and to be curious enough to ask the question why. And then the motivation to go investigate an answer for yourself and having kind of the detail oriented approach of um, you know, checking your facts along the way and getting to that answer. Um, it's just like kind of a, a virtuous feedback loop, so to speak, that just like the more that you can say, oh, is that right? Why is that? And then get yourself an answer and, you know, check yourself along the way and make sure that um, you're on the right track is is something that I think, you know, no matter what field you're in is is a really valuable trait. Um, and certainly in, in my professional experience, it's something that's helped me um, operate at a higher level um, with, you know, our executive teams and such. It's like, you, if you can come and say, I asked this question, why? And then I found this answer. And then my recommendation of the next thing to do is this um, is, is a really you know, useful uh, way to approach a lot of problems. So curiosity, I'd say. I agree with Jay. I think that's a, a great uh, trait and skill to have. I think um, in addition to that, I'd say for research there, I I think um, a motivation to connect and build community, I think is what makes um, maybe one of the factors that makes research more impactful or could make research more impactful. So being motivated to connect with communities, um, have a presence in your community without a need, don't only connect with your communities when you need data. <laughs> Um, so having a presence in your community, um, and I would say that uh, listening is probably another really great skill that will not only make your science better, but will make your job more fulfilling. So I would say I would add those couple of things. I think to add on to Liz's comment on connection, um, I think being able to communicate with um, people with very different backgrounds than uh, than you have um, I think the a term to describe that is cross-cultural communication, being able to communicate and be comfortable communicating with uh, people that are from very different backgrounds from your own. Um, and as a community health worker, there are things that I think I will never understand not being going through the immigration experiences of people coming from Congo and Angola fleeing torture and um, horrible things. And I think a, a very important part of working with um, people who have these experiences is uh, having some sort of experience like that yourself. So that's why I think um, a lot of community health workers and effective community health workers are um, people who have gone through these experiences. I think almost almost any, as you've heard, the, the breadth of public health, almost any skills can be applied to public health. But I really agree with, with the other panelists, what they've been saying, Jay, about curiosity. And, and one thing I always try to keep in mind is when you not just ask that question once, but keep asking it of a lot of different people, because you might get a lot of different answers and, and the kind of humility that Noah is talking about. I think also it's important to, to have some patience um, because a lot of a lot of our work takes a long period of time. It, it can be it can be pretty efficient to to you know identify the problem and, and a potential intervention or policy solution. But uh, you know, people don't always do what you want, and it can be a long process to to work with communities and and get get people really on on board and and to to make that kind of change takes takes some real time. Um, I would just add a plug, um, really, maybe in, in particular on top of what Jay and Kate said. Um, 
around scientific rigor training. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's great to see people at all stages of their career interested in public health. Um, but I worry sometimes when people get really excited about public health and its breadth very early on in high school or early in college and just focus on the breadth of public health. Um, I really get to do a lot because I jumped into public health, got excited and then jumped out and trained as a physician and got some additional training along the way. Um, it's, you know, I, I run across a number of people who are early in their public health careers and are really focused on knowing a lot of details about what we do, but sometimes miss the scientific rigor um, and intellectual curiosity perhaps of understanding why we do it. Um, and I would, when I look for people to hire into this health department, I'm much more interested in someone who has some particular skills to bring to the table and can come in and learn about public health priorities. That offers a lot more than someone who understands the breadth but doesn't have a specific skill set that they offer. Um, so don't be afraid to go and get additional training before you jump into public health or to jump into public health and then figure out what additional skills you want and go get them. You, you learn a lot on the job, but you can also learn a lot in school. Um, I saw someone put a comment in the chat about sort of being at the stage of their career where they're not sure which path they want to take. And I would say, you know, don't, don't get held up by trying to figure out which path you're going to follow for your entire career. You can start anywhere and figure out where to go from there, or you can go and pick up the skills that you think you want to bring to any situation and then figure out where you feel like you want to plop in. Thank you all so much for those really great answers to that question. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat here uh, for Liz um, in particular, but um, for it says it's from Ren and it says for those of us interested in data and epi related careers, do you recommend skills in R or SAS? What are you using for software tools in your day to day? It's a really good question, Ren. Um, I would say that probably the most widely utilized software that I, I see in my personal place of work and also broadly across disciplines is, is R. I think that that's a, a really, um, it's growing in use quite a bit. I would also say though that I still, in addition to R, also use SPSS. That's what I was trained in. And sometimes it's just what I feel most comfortable in depending on my workload. And I also know quite a few folks that use SAS. So I think that really the key is going to be um, as we build out R and it becomes more, uh, even more widely utilized, I think being able to have some crosstalk between your softwares is probably the most important thing. Um, so uh, I would say that if you are comfortable in SAS, learning how to um, start challenging yourself to um, maybe create analogous code or run, you know, things in R so that you can cross compare and start building that crosswalk for yourself and that cross language for yourself. Um, but so I still think, I don't think SAS and SPSS are going anywhere, but I do see quite a few people using R. So if you can kind of start to talk the R language and get a little bit more familiar with that, I think that would be um, very, very beneficial. It also just gives you wild, you know, creative freedom in terms of what you can build and, and run in terms of your models. It's it's a pretty amazing software. So it um, I would say definitely, definitely try to, try to, um, uh, learn some R, but if you use SAS, that's okay too. And coming from a kind of tech company background, like we we use R. Um, we don't use a whole lot of statistical modeling outside of R. Um, in my academia world, we used SBSS and SAS and Stata and you name it. Like if everybody kind of researchers came in with their own kind of toolbox of what programs they want to use and that's what they went with. And then we always had a fun time trying to aggregate things together and figure out whose code was, uh, you know, applying it the right way. And then getting our final published results was like a bit of an exercise. But um, I, I think R is one where I've seen it both from academia in through kind of high growth tech company. But I'd also say like now I see even a lot of um, like SQL based like programming and database management in um, we use DBT a lot. And so like being able to as we get more and more big data, so to speak, being able to manage databases and figuring out how to like have the data environment itself 
structured in the right way and being able to pull in together a lot of different data sources, having a little bit more upstream ability beyond just the statistical manipulation and statistical modeling on top of the data set that's already prepared for you, I think is, is also a really valuable tool depending on how deep you want to go in kind of data management. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is like, you should, if you're interested in it, you should dabble with what chat GPT can do for you too. And like, you can remarkably translate between code sets and like it, it's pretty interesting and, and, and scary a little bit, but um, you should test it out a little bit if you're interested. Um, I just want to add one more comment. I realized this was largely a question about statistical software packages, but since the question asked about sort of what to pursue when you're interested in data and epi related careers. I just wanted to put in a plug to say that I don't see epi as a data heavy or statistically heavy discipline. Um, there is plenty of epi that really benefits from complex models and big data sets. There's also a huge amount of epi that is basic and descriptive. Um, I've done very well in my career and I can't remember the last time I needed a two by two table. Um, just seeing things and describing them and making those initial assumptions um, building that initial understanding um, is a huge piece of the pie. So for people who are interested in epidemiology, but feel like really understanding complex stats isn't you, um, there's still plenty of need for you. Thank you all for those, those answers to that question. Um, and we have a question from Daphne that says, would you say that your bachelor's degree matters when going into a career in public health? And then would you recommend getting an MPH? The most important thing about your bachelor's degree is finding something that you're passionate about. And I think this really ties back into some of the comments that Jay made earlier about curiosity. Um, really, you know, my mom was right. She told me about, you know, 20 something years ago to just study in college, whatever I found interesting. And I didn't, it took me a while to understand that. Um, but um, you should really focus your college time on bringing a rigorous level of understanding and critical thinking to anything, um, because that's going to form the basis for whatever you do after that. Um, in my case, it happened to be physics, and that set me up well for a career that draws heavily on sciences. But um, I work with plenty of people who, you know, started their time in academia in, you know, history or philosophy or dance or art. Um, and really developed some rigorous thinking along the way in approaching those topics in a college setting. Um, I'll also just say um, to the question about whether to get an MPH. So I firmly believe, and I'm sure there are other perspectives here that I want to hear, but um, an MPH is great in two places in your career. It can be great right out of college if you know you're interested in public health, but you're not really sure where in public health you want to land and you want to pick up some basic and broad skills across disciplines and get exposure to a wide range of disciplines. Alternatively, if you fall into public health a little farther along in your career and are already in the workforce, an MPH can be great a little bit later in your career when you know exactly how you want to focus it. Maybe you want to um, jump out of one area and accelerate your path into global health or into chronic disease management or into biostatistics. An MPH can be a really good way to shift an area of focus. Outside of those, I don't think that everyone needs one. I work with plenty of people here who don't have an MPH. I'm slowly working on one in the background when it met my needs, but um, I've been doing just fine without it. I agree with everything that Isaac just said. I'd add one additional value point to an MPH or frankly, any degree that you go through. It's, again, I go back to the network, right? Like what was really valuable for me in my MPH more than anything else was getting to know my MPH professors who then introduced me to all the people who are doing public health work in the greater Portland area, who I then was able to like go send an email and be like, I'm a grad student interested in what you do. And they're like, yeah, I'll give you 30 minutes, like come sit down and I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. And like, I did that a lot and it was really useful and it ended up getting my first job. And like that, I think is a really, it, it like you can, it kind of sounds silly to like go to school for that because there are other totally other benefits to it, right? Like you learn a lot along the way and it is a valuable education, but more than anything else, like the connection into the people who are doing the work that you want to get into was invaluable for me. 
I'm going to provide a slightly different perspective because in the global health world that I've inhabited, unless you're a clinician or a very specialized expert in something as Isaac was describing, everybody has an MPH. Our, our assistants had MPHs. So everybody we hired had an MPH. So, you know, I just from that world, it's kind of considered the baseline. And which is not to say that it should be that way, but just that that that's kind of what was expected from people. To go off what Jay was saying, I think the the real benefit of the my bachelor's degree and being a very recent graduate as well, um, the connections that I got out of uh, the professors of cool classes that I took, um, and I got a mentor out of a program that I applied to in um, during undergrad that has connected me to great global health programs um, and has encouraged me to apply for a Fulbright scholarship and um, Peace Corps and has so many connections within global health that um, have been so valuable um, to my my career. And um, to address the MPH, that's something that I'm considering. There are certainly things um, with just a, a bachelor's degree that I don't know and skills that I don't have. Um, I'm, I definitely think that I should go back to, to school and learn, learn more, whether that's an MPH or something else. Um, I'm not sure. And I don't have an MPH, so I probably, um, can't speak too much to that, but I will say, I think I love I love the comment of your degrees, be it bachelor or anything else being um, something that, you know, sparks your passion, because I think what I have learned through um, obtaining all of my all of my degrees is that um, I have learned how to learn and that will serve you in everything that you do. So um, I hear it all the time that a PhD is just really a degree in learning. I've learned how to learn all kinds of things. So and that that's broadly broadly helpful, broadly applicable. So um, I think that there's a lot of value in pursuing what you are passionate about and that there will be a place for you to bring your expertise and the lens that you've honed expertise in um, to, to public health field. Wonderful, thank you all so much. Um, Julia, if you have a question. Good morning, uh, thank you all. So much for being here. Um, I have a question kind of specifically for Noah. Um, as prior to starting my MPH, I was in working in a setting as a clinical assistant supporting physicians. And I'm just curious kind of what your interaction and like dialogue looks like with physicians as in the role of a community health worker. Yeah. So um I was working in a few hotels and we were doing outreach with uh, physicians, nurse practitioners in particular, that were primary care doctors that came to the hotels um, Monday and Wednesday, a couple times per week. So um, I would assist in things that the nurse practitioner um, couldn't do in the 15 or 30 minutes that they were meeting with the patient. Um, like paying for for medical care and signing them up for insurance, um, making sure that their social determinants of health were addressed, applying for food supplements, um, and uh, helping with their legal immigration issues. Um, I it's really cool to spend time and learn about the medical things that the primary care physicians are addressing. Um, but I also get to um, develop uh, relationships with the, the patients as well outside of the doctor patient relationship and address other needs that they might, might have um, outside of just their medical concerns. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Do we have any more questions for anyone in the audience? Go 
Great. Okay, so I I um, will ask a, a question that I'm kind of curious about as someone who's a student interested in pursuing public health. Um, so anyone can answer, but what do you think some of the growing sectors of public health are and what can students do to learn more about them? I'm sure there are lots of answers to this, but I'll, I'll give one, which is I think that unquestionably environmental health, everything from the effects of climate change um, in terms of growing zoonoses to actual heat effects and, and, and then the other aspects of environmental health around you know, the increased presence of human-made toxins. I think it's it's a really important, really important area. It's not one I'm very knowledgeable. For years, I taught a global public health course to undergraduates, and the one class I always had somebody else come in and teach was environmental health. But if I were in grad school today, I would definitely be taking whatever whatever courses I could in this broad, huge topic. It's it's really crucial for for the future. I think that's a great area, Kate. Another area I would say is um, social drivers of health, um, much like social determinants, but understanding how social mechanisms um, and systemic uh, factors like like prejudice, discrimination, racism, things like that impact and intersect with um, health, I think is um, is a really um, is a really big and growing area. So um, I would I would add that. Um, there are two areas in particular that I'll highlight. The first is informatics, um, really understanding how to manipulate data, how to move data, how to use data um, is something that we're getting, we're sort of constantly learning to do better in public health and an area where there's a real need for more people and where there is, there are jobs. Um, you know, I, I love environmental health. I worked in environmental health for <clears throat> many years, sort of on my way into public health. Um, I love environmental health and wish I could do more of it. It's a challenging area to get funding in part because it tends to sort of span across a lot of other disciplines. So there are parts of it that sort of live in primary environmental health, parts of it that live in communicable disease and, and elsewhere, but very important and agree on that. Um, <clears throat> the other area that I'll mention is just chronic disease. So, you know, I think it tends to be sort of like the less sexy end of public health, but um, hugely impactful. You know, infectious diseases can ramp up and can cause havoc, um, but mostly what's killing people are chronic diseases. So um, finding any of the chronic disease areas, whether it's, you know, maternal child health or cardiovascular disease or smoking and obesity or so many others, um, there's a huge impact that you can make there. And I'd, I'd add mental health conditions to that too, Isaac, and that, that's the world that I live in. And I, this is interesting. The, the first one, environmental health, I think is, is very uh, important. And I, and I agree with there's like endless career opportunity. You'd spend your a lifetime working in, in that field and only scratch the surface, I'm sure. Um, I think looking at social drivers of health is is definitely an important one. Um, and health equity is is like one of the first. So I had I had three on my list that I had already written down in response to the prompt, which were health equity, data science, and then value and outcomes. So um, it that kind of ties together. Data science is what I end up using that a lot for. Is like did your intervention work, and like what are the data methods that you can use to say whether this intervention had impact or not. Um, but I I also think that. It, to Isaac's point, like most of what we're evaluating in, in my world is whether an intervention against a chronic disease had impact in making people healthier and driving down total cost of care to the system. And, you know, that that is absolutely where the, the funding opportunity is. Like it's from my experience, it's easiest to be able to say that if you can manage a chronic condition and make people healthier on readmission rates or on like any a number of screening and assessment tools where we have like lab values and like there's data there where you can say, yes, I had impact. Like that's being able to measure and track and demonstrate impact is, is really important, I think. 
Um, and, and it speaks to the kind of point around curiosity too. It's like, did, I'm curious, is this working or not? Like, here's the data that shows the answer to that. Um, and if you can show that you're, you're having impact by keeping people healthier and keeping them say out of the hospital, like that saves money to the system. And that is often the way to fund a lot of work. It's certainly been my experience at least. That's a really great point. And thank you for these great questions from the audience. Um, for just kind of like a little, little wrap up, um, I was wondering if the panelists could each maybe share a piece of advice or a takeaway. Um, that would be great. Um, I'll, I'll jump in to start. I think um, as you as you make your way into your public health career and through your public health career, think about what it is that you actually enjoy doing every day and what it is that actually sustains you. Um, you know, right now, one particular area of health need, and that's really important, but um, sometimes it's hard to sort of keep your eyes on the prize about where you're going to be in six months. So think about what it is that you're actually doing every day. Do you enjoy interacting with people? Do you enjoy working with data? Um, what is it that you want to do? And then think about how it is, what it is that actually sort of sustains you. So for me, I don't have a lot of projects that I own or oversee. I, I'm really involved in helping a lot of things across the health department. And for me, really seeing at least one thing every day that I felt like I positively influenced is how I define success in my job. Um, and it can be a little harder because I don't have sort of clear benchmarks for lots of things that are mine. Um, but I think it's just really important to figure out what success looks like for you um, so that you can figure out, you know, whether you, whether you feel like you're getting what you want to out of your job. I would say a piece of advice um, as you are thinking about your career in public health, it's a wonderfully interdisciplinary um, of space. So I think the more that you can not just talk to people who um, maybe have your exact professional background, but talk to all different people and start get, kind of developing that common shared language and shared understanding um, and understanding all the different ways that people can think about the different orientations to approaching a problem, I think um, would be really, really helpful. And um, it's also just super fun. It's a whole new kind of learning. So I would say um, start getting your interdisciplinary network and conversation started. Yeah, I like that. Network, be curious, and there's no wrong way to start. Focus on the things that are the opportunities in front of you, and um, you'll grow with them, and you'll learn what you like and what you don't like, and the next step will be more of what you, if with any luck, the next step will be more of the things that you did like and less of the things that you didn't like, and and I think that's a, a nice way to approach your career path in general. So. And I would add that, especially being super early in a career in public health, uh, to be humble about what you know and realize that there are so many things to continue learning, um, especially with public health being a very inter interdisciplinary um, field to go into. Um, and also finding things that you enjoy doing that um, won't have you burning out in a few years down the line of finding things that you really enjoy uh, doing and you can continue doing for a long time. I think all of those are really excellent pieces of advice. Um, the only, the only, I, I don't really have anything to add, except I would say just to encourage people to pursue public health as a career. I think for all the reasons that have been outlined, it's really, really rewarding and and endlessly stimulating. And then the other, the only piece of advice I would give is is to not um not not shy away from from bold opportunities that present themselves because you think that you might not be able to do it. Um, the world is full of people who learned as they went and and so be be bold about seizing the opportunities that come your way thank you all so much for your 
incredible advice and for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for coming to watch as well and engaging with our panelists. Um, I'm going to encourage you to become a Maine Public Health Association member. Um, if you aren't already, there's a lot of really great information and events and things like this um, that you can become a part of, as well as a mentorship program, which I also engage in. I have an amazing mentor um, who works in public health and infectious disease, um, and I've really enjoyed that experience. So if that's something you're interested in, um, applications will come around next year again for that program. Um, so again, thank you all, both panelists and audience members, for coming to join us today, um, and I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday.